class with Dr. W and our continuing study of the year 1968. In the previous lectures, we've talked about the Vietnam conflict and many of the factors leading us up to the doorstep of 1968. Now let's talk about one of the major events of this year, and particularly early in the year, the Tet Offensive. On January 30th, 1968, during the North Vietnamese holiday of the Lunar New Year, called Tet, they launched a massive offensive into population centers and against American military bases in South Vietnam. Some 84,000 Viet Cong and North Vietnamese soldiers participated. They attacked Saigon, the capital, five of the six largest cities, 36 of 44 provincial capitals, and virtually all major American military installations. The Tet Offensive, or Tet 68, is the major turning point of the Vietnam War, but perhaps not for the reasons we might think. The initial attacks from North Vietnamese forces were quickly turned back. None of the cities they penetrated were captured permanently, and over the following months, as the North Vietnamese were driven back, they suffered enormous casualties, with American and South Vietnamese casualties comparatively light. The Viet Cong, now out in the open in this major attack, were virtually wiped out. There was no revolution in the South against Saigon, and militarily, the attack was an utter failure for the North. Politically, though, Tet was a crucial turning point. In the United States, the attack led many to question the Johnson administration even further. Americans had to ask whether we were, in fact, winning the war. We had to challenge Lyndon Johnson and his wartime policies. We had to wonder if and when it would ever end. Tet would set in motion political forces that saw the downfall of the Johnson presidency and ultimately the beginning of the withdrawal of American forces from Vietnam. Planning for the Tet Offensive began in the spring of 1967, a year or so before the attack was launched. Leaders in the North were growing tired of the war of attrition and thought the time was ripe to demonstrate to American leaders that they were still strong that the United States would not prevail in the long run. They also expected that the lengthy occupation by American troops in the South had accumulated frustration within the population. They thought a convincing attack would spark a revolution against the weak Saigon government. It would free the civilians to rally to their cause and would ultimately result in the unified and liberated Vietnam promised in 1945. They thought a powerful attack might also convince the Arvin, the South Vietnamese army, to quit. Attacks on civilian centers would demonstrate that the Saigon government and the Americans could not protect them, that the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese could attack anyone, anywhere, anytime. They also hoped that the Americans themselves would quit. The initial phase of the attack began in October 1967 when the North Vietnamese launched a series of powerful attacks across the demilitarized zone into South Vietnam. These were designed to pull American forces away from the population centers of the South, which were the primary targets in the main offensive to come. These initial attacks led to fierce fighting, heavy casualties on both sides, and they achieved their goal. Westmoreland did move a substantial number of American troops to the North, in fact, leaving Saigon completely in the hands of South Vietnamese defenders. By late fall, intelligence and information from prisoners and defectors indicated that a major attack was coming in early 1968. Westmoreland believed the attack would come across the demilitarized zone and continued strengthening forces there. He strengthened the American forces at Khe Sanh and other northern American bases. In January, intelligence indicated large numbers of northern forces moving on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and a possible large attack coming further south. Westmoreland responded by moving some number of American forces along the Cambodian border and a few nearer to Saigon. He also urged that South Vietnamese forces remain on active duty even during the traditional ceasefire and holiday of Tet, the Lunar New Year. These efforts might just have saved Saigon from falling during the attack. 
The second phase of the operation is what Americans call the Tet Offensive, or Tet 68. This was the major attack beginning on January 30th and simultaneously launched against so many cities and bases. Among these attacks was one against the American Embassy in Saigon, which succeeded in blowing a hole through the wall at the perimeter, allowing some 19 Viet Cong commandos access to the embassy. Within a few hours, the commandos were killed or captured and the building was secure. But that attack, some of which was filmed and appeared on American television, made a dramatic impact on the home front. There were other attacks on important buildings in Saigon, including the Presidential Palace and American headquarters and neighboring air bases. South Vietnamese forces fought to defend the city and installations effectively. American reinforcements arrived to help drive off the enemy, and as noted, there was no popular uprising in Saigon. At the same time, Viet Cong forces launched numerous attacks throughout the countryside. At Nha Trang, a coastal city of 120,000, against Kon Tum and Plei Ku. Elsewhere, Viet Cong troops were intercepted in the field attempting to launch attacks. Everywhere, the attacks were driven back in fierce fighting, with heavy casualties inflicted on the enemy. The fighting spread to the Mekong Delta, with similar results. The heavy losses inflicted against the Viet Cong, and the fact that many of them had made themselves known in attempting to spark a rebellion, would set back recruitment efforts for the Viet Cong by years. In fact, the Viet Cong never recovered from the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive climaxed at Hue, the traditional capital of the South, and a city of great historic significance and beauty. It had been spared attack up to that point in the war. The battle to retake Hue took over a month, as a powerful force, some 7,500 North Vietnamese regulars and Viet Cong elite troops held much of the city. American troops and South Vietnamese began to drive back the invaders, and their numbers grew as reinforcements came to the scene. North Vietnamese positions were bombarded by gunfire from U.S. naval forces positioned offshore, and American aircraft bombed and strafed the city. American ground troops engaged in house-to-house -house combat in the streets. While much of the city was recaptured by early February, enemy troops held some positions until late February. The final few stragglers were rounded up on March 2, 1968, after a month of some of the hardest fighting of the entire war. Over 8,000 soldiers on both sides were killed in the battle. Over 75% of the population of Hue was rendered homeless, and the historic city was left in ruins. As one historian has put it, the beautiful city was a shattered, stinking hulk, its streets choked with rubble and rotting bodies. The final phase of the northern offensive was the attack at Khe San. Some 60 miles northwest of Hue, near the demilitarized zone, this base had been reinforced at Westmoreland's order and was defended by 6,000 troops, mostly American Marines, along with some South Vietnamese Rangers. These troops ultimately came under siege by an enemy force numbering some 30 to 40,000 troops. North Vietnamese General Jap, who planned this phase of the attack, hoped that Khe San might be America's Tien Binh Phu, the climactic battle leading to their surrender. Remember the French defeat at Dien Binh Phu. Part of his plan hinged on the first two phases of Tet being more successful. He hoped that the attack at Khe San would put a capstone on several months of failures and surrenders. But that hadn't happened. So the attack was launched anyway, but it didn't follow on the heels of numerous defeats of American and South Vietnamese troops. The American troops at Quezon were ultimately held under siege for 77 days. The attack drew great coverage in the American media, who feared that the base might be overrun. Lyndon Johnson himself was concerned, and contemplated at times the use of tactical nuclear weapons. 
But Kaisan was never in danger as Dien Bien Phu had been. With the full force of American air support and artillery, Kaisan never lost its ability to defend or supply itself. It launched withering attacks upon the enemy, daring them to make a direct attack against the position. This defense of Kaisan was known as Operation Niagara, a concentration of firepower composed of B-52s, tactical aircraft, and artillery blasting away at enemy positions. From January 20th to March 11th, the battle raged around the clock. From February 29th to March 1st, a regiment of North Vietnamese troops charged Khe Sanh from the east, but they were decimated by American firepower and never approached the base itself. By March 11th, Jap recognized that Khe Sanh would not be taken and began to withdraw his forces. And because with the failure of the other two phases of the offensive, this battle would prove to be less decisive. Enemy losses, killed and wounded, are estimated at some 10,000. Meantime, roughly 200 American Marines were killed. With the end of the siege at Quezon, the Tet Offensive was concluded. Lyndon Johnson called it a complete failure for the enemy. All told, the Vietnamese killed were estimated at over 58,000 for the two months of battle nearly 70% of all of their troops committed to the campaign. The total losses, killed and wounded, for American and South Vietnamese forces numbered around 3,400. The Viet Cong structure, so painstakingly developed over the previous years, was in a shambles. No revolution against Saigon was launched. South Vietnamese troops had acquitted themselves well in the fighting and expected to gain recruits from it. It, appear, it appeared that a counteroffensive might be able to conquer the North Vietnamese once and for all. So militarily, the Tet Offensive was a complete failure for the North Vietnamese. However, the Tet Offensive would become something of a paradox in American and military history. It was a thoroughly convincing military victory for the United States, but in the long run, it would become symbolically the greatest defeat of the war. In our next lecture, we'll talk about this element of the aftermath of the Tet Offensive.